There is noise all around us. Noise that causes us to turn, pause, think, argue, fight, study, spin. Every day we are waking up to new challenges that demand our attention and our action. We can be left feeling hopeless and burdened by the amount of things spiraling around us. And the world's response to this? Woke. Be informed, stay aware, pay attention to the issues. This demands much of us. More research, more podcasts, more action, more, more, more. And although the word woke has become overused and saturated, what if I told you this was a biblical concept? Paul calls the sleepy church to wake up. But wake up to what? You see, culture is not far off in choosing battles to fight for. But what if, in all our wokeness, we're actually asleep to what's most important? We believe there is a master schemer who is working to torment your soul and steal your peace. Behind the social issues that woke has been linked to, as a church we need to become more aware, more awake, more woke to an enemy that is working to destroy all of us. Many of us are fighting against an enemy we don't know. But we have been given the tools to know not just how to fight the battle, but win the war. The war for our souls. All right, good morning. <laughs> I was, it's like so epic. Um, as you just saw, we are also beginning a new series today called Woke. And you're still here. I didn't see anybody get up and leave, so I can talk to you about this. Um, if you have been here the last three weeks, you have seen that video now three times. And the reason that we're showing this video every week is to be really clear about the purpose of the series. What I don't want is anyone picturing me up here the, in the next nine weeks on some political soapbox or some rant on culture where I tell you how to believe or think about every issue. I do want to be clear, we are going to talk about what is going on in our culture, which the church, I believe, has always been called to do. And we can say, oh, we just preach Jesus, which is great, and I believe that, but then we need to be ready to talk about what Jesus talked about. Um, and so that is what we're going to be doing, but I want to be clear that we are all about God's Word. And if you've been at Mac very long, you know that way, that's where we start. Um, and that's what begins the conversation. That's what we come back to. Um, not to avoid talking about what's going on in our world, but the lens through which we understand it, as opposed to our favorite news media channel or what our culture says or thinks. We say, we ask, what does God say? Are we on the same page there, I hope? That's who we are as a church, and, and that's what we're going to get into in the next nine weeks. What does God say about the ultimate threat to every one of us, to which we need to be awake, aware, woke? And my hope is that we can come to the table, which I realize is a big ask in our culture right now, and pull back the curtain on some of these cultural issues and arguments and really see what's behind all of these issues. Um, and what I believe we're going to find and, and unpack throughout the next nine weeks is we have an enemy who hates every single one of us. He is, in contrast to Jesus who came to bring, quote, abundant life, he is an enemy who came to steal, kill, destroy, and we could add on frustrate and confuse and divide and all of the symptoms that we see in our culture. Behind that is a schemer who hates us. And so it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter if you are uh, what your race is. I know that our culture has weaponized those things. Our culture has turned those, uh, used those things to turn us against each other. If you don't know that, you're, you're asleep. Um, it's a huge problem, but the Bible has always been very clear that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Um, it's good to remember if you're looking at somebody who votes differently than you. Just say that to yourself. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That doesn't mean we don't have differences and that those differences aren't significant and worth the conversation. But ultimately, underneath it all, our struggle is against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is the root of our ultimate struggle. And I believe this is what we, even as Christians, often live oblivious to. In all of our wokeness, it is ironic to me that we can be surprisingly sleepy when it comes to the real threat to our souls. 
And so I just want to acknowledge when we, when I reference the, the spiritual forces of evil, I want to recognize the risk that we could take this too far, that we could overemphasize this. And there is a demon behind every bush and every problem I have is because the devil said so. Um, we're going to talk in two weeks about how that is not true. We have a flesh that honestly, left to itself, loves going after the things of the world. Uh, we have the world, which is the influence, um, but Satan is the one who is scheming and using all of that against us. But, you know, there is a risk of going too far. I have been a part of certain church cultures where I think, gosh, I think maybe we're overemphasizing the enemy. I will say, though, there's an equally great risk of ignoring it altogether. And I think in our culture, it's so easy to do that, where we imagine that with all of our technology, with all of our stuff, with all of our, our science and our medicine, and if you have a problem, you just need the pill, I think that we've maybe gotten to a place where we imagine we're a little too sophisticated for this, for conversations about demons or the devil. So the first question we have to really wrestle with, and, and I think maybe in an ongoing way, do we believe what the Bible teaches? Do you believe what the Bible teaches, that you can work your whole life to gain the whole world and still lose your soul? Do you believe that you could get everybody to agree with you on every issue and they could still perish for eternity if they don't know Jesus Christ? You see, the ultimate reality is this enemy who hates us and wants to lead us away from God and turn us against each other any way he can. And it's being aware of that. I know Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 writes these words, not to a pagan culture ranting on the, you know, the secularism, but he writes it to the church and he says this, you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so let us not sleep as others do do, but let us keep awake and be sober. That's like the biblical definition of woke. Because <laughs> he says, let's not be asleep as others are. It makes a distinction. There's people who are asleep. And now, obviously, he's speaking of spiritual realities. He is not talking about um, drunkenness any more than he's saying we shouldn't go to bed at night. He is talking about an awareness, an alertness to the reality of our ultimate struggle and not being oblivious. So this series is about living as a people who are truly woke, not just to a handful of issues that we think everyone should see the same way we do, but woke to the spiritual struggle beneath the issues. You know, I was um, out with a friend a few weeks back on the patio of this particular establishment, we were hanging out, and there was music out there uh, playing popular music, and I think it was from the 90s, which is kind of my jam, sorry. But the music is playing, and um, I was talking with my friend, and we were kind of talking about some of this stuff just off the top of our heads, and I asked him, I said, hey, do you know what song just got done playing? And the music was very obvious. It was, it was loud. It was very clear. The speaker was right there by our heads. I said, do you know what just got done playing? And he thought about it, and he's like, I have no idea. Because it had been playing all along, we just weren't tuned into it. We weren't aware of it, but what's fascinating is after I asked that question, the rest of our conversation, we like interrupted each other and like, hey, oh, yep, that's the Spin Doctors or whatever. There's a 90s band. Um, we, we, we called it what it is. And so that is one of our goals for this series is that we could recognize the reality that's always present, the way that this enemy always is working, but be able to call it what it is. Be able to name it, to say, oh, that's a scheme of the enemy that wants me to turn on that person. And so that is one of our, our, our desires and our hearts for this series is that we would be equipped to engage with that. Now, in case you're curious, I wanted to very quickly let you know uh, very quickly where the series is going. The first three weeks is all about raising awareness. Anyone ever raise awareness for something? Where you realize like, hey, this is really important and I don't think people know it's important, so you talk to friends, you maybe post something online, you're raising awareness. That's what we're going to be doing. Today, the reality that you have an enemy, and he's probably not who you think. And what I mean by that is we have made enemies out of each other in our culture, and we've forgotten the reality of the ultimate enemy who just laughs when we do that. We have an enemy, and he's not who you think. That's today. Next week, we're going to talk about who is that enemy. What is the nature? You know, what do you picture when you think of the devil? Is it the guy with horns? Is it a dragon? And if we don't know who our enemy is, there's no way we can respond to his schemes. So we're going to talk about the activity of the enemy in our lives. How would I even know 
or recognize if the enemy was working in a situation, right, versus God. Uh, The third week is all about the world and the flesh and how Satan loves it. It's like this the star quarterback in his schemes is right here. <laughs> it's my own desires. And then there's this world system that is against God that, that we all, apart from Christ, walk according to and just follow. And there's so many scriptures that hold those three influences together. And so we're going to pull those apart and look at them in three weeks. But then after we raise awareness, the point isn't just to be aware. If I'm camping and you told me there's a grizzly bear outside your tent... <laughs> and I had nothing to defend myself with, that would not be comforting. And so we are going to move past simple awareness and say, how do we respond to the schemes of our enemy? Defensively, the Bible says, resist the enemy. Uh, You don't have to go there. But then more importantly, what are the tools God has given us to fight back as his people? We are not sitting ducks. We are not victims. We are victors through Jesus Christ. So how do we take hold of the victory? I think about Joshua. God said, "Um, I have given that land into your hands. I've given it to you. And then he says in the next sentence, now go and take it. Isn't that cool? And I think God does the same for us. He's like, I've given you all of it, but you got to take it. You got to pick it up. You got to use it. You got to, you know, so that's what we're basically going in in the series and what we're going to be with the first week. Today, we're going to look at a verse that is the building block for the series. This is uh, what I was reading when I had the idea for this series and was sort of, I believe, prompted by God to start to lay this all out and plan it. It was this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. If you have a Bible and you want to start making your way there, uh, we'll look there in a little bit. But in this one verse, Paul is addressing problems in the early church. He's writing to this church. And if you didn't know, Corinthians is um, the Christians in the city of Corinth, which is modern day Greece. And there was, a, there was a church there, a Christian church, and Paul wrote two letters, which is why if you look in the New Testament of the Bible, you have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. He wrote two letters separated by about two years. And in this second letter, he's addressing some problems, and there was one particular problem that he said, you really need to respond to this problem like this, and he outlines it, and I'll tell you in a minute what that is. And if you, if you don't, the reason you have to respond this way is, quote, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You see, Paul is, is, is recognizing, first of all, the reality of an enemy who's always scheming and trying to outsmart us. That's literally what that means. To get the best of us, to, to get us focusing over here as if this is the main thing, and meanwhile, he's over here having a heyday, Right? Or maybe he, he gets us to react in a way to somebody that feels so right, and we realize later, I played right into his hand. He loves fooling us. When I was in high school, I was on the football team, and I played defensive end on the right side of the line. And the job of a defensive end, it's kind of what it sounds like, you need to contain. You need to stay outside so that, that if the ball comes out there, you're the furthest outside and you can deal with it. Right? You can make the tackle, make the play. But I'm remembering multiple times where the quarterback who was over here for me would hike the ball and then run that way. Now, what do you think my instinct was? To run that way, right? I got to go get the quarterback. And I would run that way. And then all of a sudden, he'd pitch a ball to a guy going that way. And by then, I was not in a place where I was able to make the play. And the guy would run and score a touchdown. And then everybody, of course, knew, Micah, that was your bad. Um, I was outwitted. I was outsmarted. I I ran after something that looked like it was right, but the quarterback had another plan, and I ended up giving away points, right? Now, the cool thing is that happened enough times, and I lost count, so don't judge me, but um, that happened enough times where eventually I started to figure it out. I became less unaware of the schemes. I, when he would go that way, even though I was like, oh, I want to run and go get him, I'm like, nope, I know where I need to be. I need to stay here, right? And so as Christians, my goal is we, we begin to notice the schemes and like, you know what, that felt like I should have pushed that person away and ignored them in the lobby. Probably not good, right? Um, and so that is what we're going to be sort of unpacking in this time is, is, is learning his schemes. And what I want to do is, is um, unpack sort of the context of the statement where Paul says that we might not be outwitted by Satan, for we're not unaware of his schemes. What is, what is the scheme that he is writing about? I would suggest it is, in my opinion, it's the number one scheme. It's Satan's go-to play. 
And I'm going to leave you hanging on that for a second, what that is, before we go to 2 Corinthians 2 and look what led up to the statement. I want to ask a bigger question about this series that I think is important. And the question is this, was all this a big deal for Jesus? Was this conversation about spiritual forces of evil on his radar? Uh, because we are not approaching this as, as the church of God. We're not approaching this as people who are like, want to be more spiritual or I- interested in spirituality. Or we just want to know more about the supernatural. That is just be interesting. That's not our goal. Our goal is to be like Jesus. Amen? Right? So, I mean, yeah, that's who we are. We're followers of Jesus. So every time we open the Bible, we're not just trying to learn. We're trying to become I want to be more like you, Jesus. So the point is, if this was not a big deal for Jesus, if Jesus' only aim on earth was to, as some might suggest, help people, uh, encourage uh, civic involvement, um, you know, maybe fix some social problems, the horizontal stuff of life, if this was not the focus of Jesus, then the next nine weeks would be a waste of our time. And I can, I can confidently say that because it's not going to make us more like Jesus. But if it's true that Jesus was acutely aware of the ultimate threat to our souls, if his primary focus was to engage with this enemy and respond to the attack and bring victory to the people around him, then would you agree that this should receive our utmost attention? This is what it means to be like Jesus. And so before we look at 2 Corinthians 2, I wanted to very quickly establish what a priority this was for Jesus. Okay? This won't take long, but I think it's important so that the focus isn't on the supernatural, but it's on Jesus Christ, who he was and who we are called to become more like. So in Mark chapter 1, the first recorded words of Jesus' public ministry uh, are this, the time has come and the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what Jesus said. The first thing out of his mouth, according to Mark, was the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, Jesus could have said, hey, everybody, I'm here to heal the diseases. Hey, everybody, I'm going to feed some crowds. All of that's true. But everything that he did fell under the banner of this statement, the kingdom of God is here. Now, we could spend a lot of time on the kingdom. I'll just say the kingdom, a kingdom is, is, is the scope of a ruler's influence. And by extension, it is, the, it is the area, the lives in which the influence of the ruler is felt, the values of the ruler, the will of the ruler. And you feel that. You live in America, that feels different than if you live in Iraq because it's a different kingdom. There's different values and laws and rulers, right? So when Jesus comes and says, the kingdom of God is here, it begs the question, what other kingdom is there? Or more specifically, what other influence were people feeling at the time? What other uh, uh, sort of wills were they being governed by and subject to? We don't have to guess at the answer. Thankfully, if you just read eight verses ahead, Jesus, after his opening statement, his first ministry activities, in verse 23 of Mark 1, he's teaching in the synagogue, and look at this interaction. It says, immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. (laughs) Wacky moment, right? But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? Would anybody say that? Right? And and I think that's part of the reason we distance ourselves from this topic. We don't get it. It's weird. Right? What is this going on? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. See, this is the very first evidence of what Jesus said at the beginning. The kingdom of God is here. And then Jesus starts casting out powers of darkness and restoring people to health. God is here. And this is the moment Satan, I think, more than any other time probably in history started to panic. We know who you are. You know, it's just like word vomit, these demons. The Holy One of God, why are you here? Are you going to destroy us? And he's like, shh, get out of him. 
This is the kingdom of God. And it says later that night, the whole city came to him and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. God had come to reestablish his reign in the lives of people. And the point is, this was a primary focus of Jesus' ministry. And yes, it expanded out into the healing of diseases. And we'll get to some of that um, a little later on. But this was the banner. And in fact, if you read Mark 1, before we even get to his opening statement, he spends 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. He overcomes every temptation. And then he comes back to give that same overcoming power to the community. You see, there's a, there's, there's a connection here, and all of it was focused on taking apart this competing kingdom. You know, if we want to know what Jesus is about, there's this verse that just jumps off the page at you in the Bible as you're, as you're studying this topic, and it's John. After he looks back at Jesus, his ministry, his life, his death and resurrection, John says this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. It doesn't get any more clear than that. Now, there are other places, Jesus says, the reason I came was to lay down my life, to serve, and all of those are true, but here's the banner statement, I came to take apart the devil's kingdom. And what we're going to see is, is not only is this Jesus' uh, ministry, this is what he entrusts the church with, the same power, the same calling to address these powers of darkness in our own hearts and in the lives of the people around us. Um, and so, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, now, if you have that passage open. You can um, turn there if you don't. If you need a Bible, use those Bibles in front of you. But these verses, as usual, will be up on the screen uh, for you to be able to follow along. But we're going to look at this statement again, that Satan might not outwit us, that, that, that I'm running this way thinking that's right, and then he throws the ball that way and he ends up scoring. We don't want that, Paul says. We don't want to be unaware of his schemes. But what scheme is he referencing? In this uh, particular chapter, back in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 2, Paul's addressing a specific problem they dealt with, and I'm going to unpack that problem a little bit. Let's just read these verses, a few verses, 5 through 8. Paul says this to the church, I am not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. Most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. In the next couple of verses, he talks about the importance of forgiveness and extending forgiveness to people who have wronged us. And he says, if, um, we have to do this. We have to do this in order that, here's where the statement comes from, Satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes. So if you read that statement in context of what Paul is saying, it would seem that this particular scheme is conflict which arises when we push each other away. For whatever reason, maybe we are withholding forgiveness or refusing to affirm love with someone who's messed up, with someone that we don't agree with, somebody that we think is wrong on an issue. And, and what's going on in this chapter is something that Paul addressed in his first letter. Two years earlier, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we read about a man, this man that Paul references here, was involved in sexual sin with his mother-in-law. And Paul finds out about it, and here's what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning and sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. So we may be able to read this and think, well, yes, yeah. I mean, that was a huge problem. You got to deal with that, right? And we can agree, theoretically. You got to address that, right? But when the situation is close to us, when it's somebody that we met during greeting time and we maybe went to coffee and heard their story, or maybe it's somebody in our life group and, and we learn that they're involved in sexual activity outside of marriage, or we learn that they're treating people harshly or speaking to people harshly, or we learn that they're drinking too much alcohol, 
I'm getting real, right? Our most default response is the path of least resistance. Can anyone say yes to that? It's to ignore it. It's to smile and nod and pretend that it's all okay and it doesn't really matter. And apparently that's what the people were doing because Paul's like, how are you not affected by this? You, you say you're the people of God, which comes with a certain character, and you're living the opposite, or at least allowing the opposite. And his advice may feel extreme to us. He says, remove this man from your fellowship. Now, to be clear, and this is important, this isn't because this was the one man in the church who had sin. Can I get an amen? Right? That, that's not the reality. I, don't, I only heard a few amens. The rest of you think you don't have sin? No. We all have sin. We're all a mess. We all are working our way through stuff. But the point is, we're working our way through stuff. We're dealing with it. We're, we're bringing it into the light. We're saying, this is not the man God's called me to be. I don't want to be that man. And we bring that to the Lord. We bring that to his word and let that inform our behavior. We bring it to community one way or another. But this man had embraced a lifestyle that was contrary to God's word. And that's why Paul says he's living in sin. He'd made his home there. And this probably, you know, I, maybe you are, maybe you know someone who says, man, I just love this community. What a cool, you know, church this is. I kind of like being associated as Christian. This is a good church. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to live how I want. And this is what was going on right here. It's like, I'm going to say I'm a Christian. I'm going to say I take God's word seriously, but my life is going to say the other thing. And it's, it's, it's kind of a big deal, right? And, and I just want to recognize that, that to say I'm going to live however I want, I want to honor and re respect the fact that this is totally normal for someone outside the church. For somebody who doesn't know Jesus, it's funny to me when Christians expect people who don't know Christ to act like they do, you know? If you could just clean that up and that up and that'll make me more comfortable. It's silly. Why would they? But for somebody who says, I follow Christ, I believe God's word, I think it has authority over the way I live my life, but then lives the opposite, that's a problem, isn't it? And, and not that any of us ever do it perfectly, but that, those, those moments have to be addressed. What kind of witness does it give a world who is desperate for a higher and a different way of life? And a hope where they say, they have something I don't have when they look at the church and it looks basically like the world. It's a problem. And I don't know that we do a good job dealing with it in the modern church because it's sort of a mind your own business culture. But Paul is like, remove this guy. Remove this guy until he, he realizes, hey, okay, no, I want to be a Christian and here's what that means and I understand that. And it seems the people listened to Paul. They removed him because if you fast forward now two years, 2 Corinthians, he says, you need to now forgive this man. You notice the difference? I want you to, to comfort this man. Receive him back. Reaffirm your love for this man. Because otherwise, this statement jumped out at me. Here's the risk. He may be overcome by discouragement. Picture this man. See, this was Satan's scheme. This man was broken. He realized what he'd done. He, want, he missed his church he wanted to come back, but apparently there were some who were reluctant to receive him back. And we don't know the reasons, but we could, we could maybe fill in the blanks that there were some who decided this guy's sin was just too big for our group. This guy's sin was of a nature that was just too gross for our group. I would never do that. And without knowing it, maybe we then put ourselves on a pedestal and we distance ourselves from people that we think we're better than or we have the right political views. And we push them out and we say, you know what, if you don't come back next week, I kind of don't care. It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a reluctance to extend love, to affirm unity based on not how we believe on every little issue, but the blood of Jesus Christ, which holds us together. And this is what Paul is urging them in this moment, is when we push each other away, we are playing right into the enemy's hands, into his schemes. And, and if I had to give this scheme a name, it's a word that you know, I would call it division. And I know that's a large banner, but that's to me the tendency to separate based on different perspectives, based on our approach to the issues. We form these camps. Even if we're all in the same room together, there's different camps. Do you know what I mean? Can anyone say yes to that? Yes. yes. 
We have different camps. And man, if, if COVID had any value, it was revealing that to me, exposing how we can do that, how divided we can become. And what's intriguing to me is Satan doesn't care how he divides us, just that he divides us. And the idea there is that he doesn't care if you're off the rails here in worldliness and sin where truth doesn't matter, um, or if you have spiritual pride and you think you're better than other people. As long as he gets you off the track, he doesn't care which direction you are. So one example of this um, is right here in our passage, because I want to take you back now to when this man was living in sin. What was the greatest threat to the unity of the community there? It was... It was, it was overlooking the sin. It was, it was taking lightly what God said was a big deal. It was pretending that, that, that it wasn't there. And, and what I would call this is a lack of truth. And practically, this is where we maybe hear God's word. Maybe we even agree because, oh, yeah, I learned that in church growing up. And it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. But at the end of the day, I'm not intending to do it. That's a little extreme. And gosh, if I do it, I'm going to get made fun of. It's a lack of seriousness related to truth. And this is one of Satan's schemes to get us to take lightly what God says. What was his first introduction in the book of Genesis? He comes to Eve and says, did God really say, did God really say that sex is for marriage? What's the big deal? Come on, prude. How old fashioned are you? Right? And, and there's also, I, 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 just, I just stop taking seriously what God has made so plain in his word. That's a scheme. And ultimately, it takes the church apart because we cease to be who God has called us to be. But then, Satan, two years later, we see this man who is repentant. He's ready to come back. He's sorry. What's the threat to unity now? Is it a lack of truth? No, that's already been dealt with. It's a lack of grace. It's a reluctance to set aside our differences and realize, hey, I don't struggle the way you do, but I struggle in my own ways, and I need Jesus just as much as you. Let's come together in that. Some were saying, I don't really know if I want that guy part of our group anymore. And Paul's like, no. You're playing right into the enemy's hands. And, and you may have noticed, speaking of truth and grace, we spent the last two weeks talking about that, leading up to this series truth and grace. But I also want to just be the first to admit it's so much easier to stand up here and talk about it than, than to do it. So much easier to talk about it than to really address the hard stuff in our own hearts and in each other's lives. But the Bible has a lot to say about that. But then at the same time to hold this tension of, of not allowing spiritual pride to creep in where I really think I'm better than you because of how I vote because of my particular brand of wokeness. See, we're, 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 and that's what Paul is trying to shepherd them in this tension. Take God's word seriously. Hold each other to that, but recognizing you're all on the same ground together at the foot of the cross. None of you has anything that earns the mercy and the grace of God at all. You're all desperate for Jesus. If you know that, then we're, we're held together and we're freed to be able to speak the truth to one another in love. But Satan's plan is to get us to push people away. And I would say, whatever the issue, that's, that's it. It's, he wants us fighting. He wants us fighting. And, it, and it's been said that the original sin is pride. Have you heard that? And I, that's probably true. Satan's desire to be God or to be like God, to be higher up than he was. I'm a bigger deal than you're, you know, allowing me to be God. And and I would say, if that's true, if the original sin is pride, I would say the original scheme is division. Because how did Satan try to be like God? He gathered a group of the angels. And he said, you know what? I know God says he's God, but check it out, man. I'm awesome. And I can show you a better way. It's the same thing he did with Adam and Eve. Eve, did God really say that? Listen, listen. I can show you another way. Do you know what the word division literally means? What's die, D-I mean in the visions? Two visions. Hey, I know God says this about what's right and wrong. Check this out, though. Or, hey, I, I know that you're supposed to love each other, but what if you didn't love that person who believes that way on that, per that cultural issue? Right? And, and he introduces another vision, and that's where division comes from. 
And that's where we break off into groups. That was his original scheme, is where we advance our self-interest and our own agenda at the expense of the community, expense of unity, at the expense of love and forgiveness. And so when Paul talks about the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, and the way I would define that is the evidence of a life that's not ongoingly surrendered to the, God, to the Spirit of God. It's a life that's not regularly allowing God's character to replace my fallen nature. That's the works of the flesh. Now, raise your hand if you think that the works of the flesh are a problem for you apart from God's Spirit. Okay, and you don't, I'd say. That was, that was bad. Um, let me just tell you, it's a problem for you. It's a problem for me. It's a problem for all of us because we're all fallen people, right? And when he talks about the works of the flesh in, in Galatians chapter 5, I, I, I think I would love it if he said, here's the works of the flesh. And then he listed off a bunch of things that I don't struggle with. Um, like, let's, I'm just murder and political corruption and drug overdose and domestic violence, okay? So that's my list. You may have a different list, but I want to be able to say that stuff is out there. Oh yeah, the works of the flesh. You mean the people in our secular culture? That's them. But unfortunately, as you read this list, I, I really see the vast majority of the list in the church as much as I see it out in the world. Now, I think we're a little more careful about the manifestation of those things. I think we're more civilized, <laughs> But it's still there apart from the active influence of God's Spirit transforming our hearts and our natural response to things. So I just wanted to hit these very quickly. Now the works of the flesh, Paul says, are evident. They're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Just to highlight the first three are categories of sexual sin. And again, we may read that and think of those people. Oh yeah, that, that secular godless culture. But I ran across a statistic this week. It was a study done by Barna Research Group that I have no pleasure in sharing with you. Showed that 68% of men who attend church regularly view pornography on a regular basis. 68% of men in church regularly admitted, that's the group that admitted, that they look at porn on a regular basis. That's shocking and it's scary. And yet if you're a man here today, and you're like me, even if you're not doing it outwardly, you're, you're, you're saying, I get it. You know why? Because Satan has gained so much ground in this area in the church. And this is one of his schemes. And when we hand, you know, fully loaded iPhones to our children and say, just be safe, we're naive. This is, this is a huge destructive problem in our culture today. And if we don't wake up to it, it's going to destroy us. And I would say if we don't allow a place for men and women to come into the light, there won't be any change. We're going to continue to be enslaved. Now, the hard part of this is I continue to read in the study, 51% of pastors admitted the same. I'm not saying this to discourage us. I'm really just trying to raise awareness. We have an enemy who's gaining ground. Whatever our favorite Netflix show at the time is, oh, kind of doesn't matter when you think about this reality. He's gaining ground in our culture. He's gaining ground in the church many times. But Paul goes on in this list to, to mention idolatry. And this is simply putting anything or anyone above God in the sense of importance. Have we done that? I've done that. I do that. The next one is sorcery. And this is one I was tempted to skip because it takes time to unpack but I didn't want to cherry pick my, my favorite words. Um, sorcery simply means going to outside power or help apart from God. That God is not ordained. But um, this is where the list gets real and where I want to focus. Listen to these. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. I'll stop there because of time, but have you noticed any of those in the church in the last three years? <sighs> and then I'll ask a harder question. Have you noticed any of these in yourself? You see, Paul doesn't list these as activities of the devil. He lists them as works of the flesh. Where do they live? 
They live right here. Apart from me actively depending on the Holy Spirit to change my heart, this is who I am. It's who we are. It is how we're going to respond if we're not desperately dependent on his power. And I just wanted to quickly hit a couple of uh, these because I, I think drilling into them is important. Enmity is a word I don't use in conversation, but it means hostile feelings towards certain people or groups of people. Strife is stirring up conflict and tension. Jealousy is a sense of possessiveness, not wanting others to have what you have, not, in, not trusting people. Fits of anger. I had to laugh because I pictured a toddler. <laughs> We've had a few toddlers in our home. Um, but I don't think Paul's just talking to toddlers. How many of us have had uncontrolled outbursts? The next is rivalries. The selfish, competitive desire to be right. To be recognized. To win. Even if someone else has to suffer in the process. Dissensions is the invisible feeling of disagreement. That one more than anything has been so clear to me in the last few years of the church. And, and by the, just so you know, I'm not picking on Mac. I think Mac is extraordinary. I really do. I've been part of churches that were so dysfunctional, I can't even say, like openly these things. But the stuff is still there, if we're honest, Right? It's this feeling of disagreement where rather than dealing with it or calling it what it is, I just avoid it. I allow the tension to build. I avoid people. And then the last, finally, divisions. I would say everything is leading up to this one where we take sides. We officialize it. We say, I'm part of this group. I know they're part of that group. I'm going to avoid them. And then the last one is envy which is pretty self-explanatory, wanting what others have in an almost obsessive way where you're like, I have to have that. Now, can I just zoom out a little bit and, 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 and capture the reality that in American culture, these aren't works of the flesh. These are the signs of success. This is what it takes to be on top. This is what it takes to climb the ladder, is I have to carve a name for myself. I have to make my opinion known in every conversation. I have to fight back. Individuality matters more than unity and community. And all of this constant tension that flows throughout it. And, and we can, again, sit back and say, yep, that's the culture. But can we say, that's here? That's me? Apart from God changing my heart, that's me contributing to this. So the goal of, of this series, as I've said, is the awareness, but it's, it starts, I think, with awareness of ourselves. <laughs> How can we unknowingly become participants in the schemes of the enemy even when we think we're going the right direction? It's also the awareness of a culture that celebrates many of the things God says is the evidence of the enemy. And opening our eyes to that and being willing to say, nope. No, that's not of God. There's no biblical value in avoiding people who vote differently from you. There's just none. You can't find it. There's no biblical value in withholding love, even from your enemies. And so like that background music at the restaurant, we need to start calling things what they are. We need to recognize that song. That's enmity. I am hostile. I don't like them. Who does that come from? God or the enemy? But even as we recognize and call things what they are, we need to remember the other half from 2 Corinthians 2, that we're not here to judge each other. We're in the same boat. We all are desperately in need of Jesus to change our hearts, to replace the works of the flesh with the fruit of his spirit. Would you say those with me if you know them? Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. See, when Paul wrote about unity in Ephesians 4, he says, make every effort to preserve the unity. 
Make every effort. If, if, if you've got plans for the weekend, cancel them <laughs> until you deal with that. But then he goes on in the chapter to give us some practical ways to fight for unity. And I'm just going to hit a couple before we close. Verse 25 of Ephesians 4, he says, Therefore, because of God's priority of unity, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Guys, um, it's so cool how God works and kind of painful because this morning, as I was preaching the first service, a, a, a person's name came to mind, and I realized I have been false with that person. I've been fake. Under the surface, I'm angry, and I've been faking it with them. And right away, that name just popped in my mind. I'm like, I have to deal with that this week. But it's where we stop pretending it's okay. We're putting on the facade of civility when really we're frustrated with each other. But as we speak truthfully, it's important to remember 10 verses earlier, Paul says, speak the truth in love. And there's that tension that he was talking about in First and Second Corinthians. But then finally, verse 26, he ties it back to the schemes of the enemy, which is why I'm referencing Ephesians 4. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and give no opportunity to the devil. See, that's what the devil wants. He just wants a foot in the door so that he can get a seat in the room. And whenever we push each other away, whenever we allow these things to go unaddressed, we give him that. We give him that opportunity. And so Paul is pretty severe. Don't even let the sun go down. Call, text, drive over, whatever you have to do to say, there's something between us and I need to deal with it. I love, though, how Paul recognizes here as an aside the reality of anger. He says, in your anger, don't sin. You know what he's saying? Anger is a valid emotion. How many have felt angry about something in our culture in the last year? Raise your hand. Okay? And I know that we've got people on all sides of these issues, which is fun. I like that. Anger is valid. If I am frustrated about something, that is a, it's to deny our emotion is to deny our humanity. To try to stuff it and say, oh, nope, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Paul in Ephesians, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4 said, do not be anxious about anything. And we read that and go, okay, I'll try. Two verses earlier, two chapters earlier in Philippians 2, Paul said, pray that I may be less anxious. The guy who said, don't be anxious, said, I'm anxious. The question is not whether or not we're going to experience frustration, anger, irritability, it's what do we do with those that doesn't allow the enemy to get his foot in the door? And so that's where the Bible talks about. In your anger, you're going to be angry. Don't sin. And the first application of what it means to not sin is to not let the sun go down while you're still angry at that person. Don't let the, don't let the sun go down. And so there are so many other passages we could turn to and we don't have time, but I just wanted to set the stage for the importance of awareness. And this is not just me raising awareness, in case you think this is like Micah's idea. This is God. And I'm not saying I speak for God. I'm just saying God is doing something broader than just Mac, related to waking us up to the reality of an enemy who's kind of been having his way. And speaking of this, I, I, I love it when, and this has happened to me three or four times when I choose a sermon series here at the church, and we land on it, we're ready to go, and then I get online, and there's another church in town that's doing the same thing. This has happened multiple times. If you're curious, I'll tell you all of the instances. Uh, one of them was we were going through the book of Proverbs, and then I got online, and Anchor, I think it was Anchor Church, said, we're doing the Proverbs this fall. And I was like, what? It was like post-COVID, I think. We need wisdom. Um, and God's like, y'all need wisdom. And then, um, you know, just after I had just finalized this, I got online and River of Life, Jason Ton in East Missoula, they're doing a series right now on the armor of God. And one of my favorite illustrations of this is in the middle of August, when I had already decided on this, my older brother published a book. Uh, he lives in Oregon. And um, he, I knew he was writing a book. I had no clue what it was about. He just told me years ago he's writing a book. And I was like, cool, bro. Um, he published it in August when I was finalizing this content. He mailed me a copy of it. 
And the title of it's a little cryptic. It's called Sidestepped, and you have to kind of explain it, which I won't. But the subtitle is this, what the enemy doesn't want you to know that can change your life. And I got this book in the mail, and I was like, what? And so, I, you know, I called my brother. I'm like, what was, what's going on here? And so, obviously, I'm reading. I'm not trying to sell my brother's book, but he's an awesome guy and loves the Lord. Um, but I was like, man, God is putting his finger on something here that we need to pay attention to. And we need to take seriously, and it's going to require some changes. Well, uh, worship team, come forward. We've got to end at some point today. So um, let me just f- close with two questions that are, I think, uh, sort of an overflow of our things I've already shared. Um, questions help me sort of reflect on where are areas that I might be outwitted right now. Where am I playing into the enemy's schemes, even, even if I feel like or I have felt like I've been on the, on the right side of the issue? Um, the first question is, who are you avoiding? This is a line I heard in a podcast a couple months ago, and it just like punched me in the stomach. Who are you avoiding? Um, it's a simple question, but has some really profound implications. Let me say, who do you feel sour toward? Who would you not be sad at all if they never came back to this church? Now I'm just thinking about church, like work, family. Extend it out to all the arenas of your life. Maybe it's a group. It's conservatives. It's liberals. Now, again, this doesn't mean there aren't conversations to have about these issues, and we will get into some of that, God willing, (laughs) and allowing his spirit to lead us through this. But this is what we're dealing with today. I can't justify my enmity or my rivalry because of those people. No. Call it what it is. It's sin. It's a work of the flesh. God needs to deal with it. We need to allow God to deal with it. So who are you avoiding? Who do you need to move toward? I've got a person I need to move toward this week, as I said. The second question is what's playing in the background of your life? You're sitting out on the patio enjoying your food, your drink, whatever. What's playing there that you have been oblivious to? Maybe it's discouragement in your life that we all face, but you've, you've succumbed to it. You've decided this is your reality. This is God's will for you. And you need to say, nope, I know what that is. That's discouragement. That's from Satan. Call it what it is. Maybe it's fear about the future. Maybe it's some lie you've been believing. But I want to point out that we don't solve any of this by ourselves. The answer is always come back to Jesus. Pour out your heart to him. Say, God, I know there's stuff in me that isn't honoring to you, and I don't know how to get rid of it. And he'll say, you don't get rid of it. I do. He will replace the works of our flesh with the fruit of his spirit, and that's what transforms the community. That's what transforms the world, which is why if you hear me standing up here week after week, month, year after year, seeming to de-emphasize the political issues. It's not because I don't care about the political issues. If you want to know my opinion, you'd probably be shocked to know it. I feel very strongly about some of the stuff that's being forced on us today. But man, at the end of the day, I'm like, what is my lane? I'm a pastor. My job is to push people toward Jesus. Because when Jesus is transforming a heart, the world around that heart changes. And apart from that, nothing will change for the better. You can't legislate this. So anyway, there's a little rabbit trail. But would you just join me in praying as we close? Do what we say. Uh, do, let's do what we're talking about, Lord Jesus. Um, we're so desperate for you. And we each could say, yep, yep, I've, I've got that stuff that's in me. Lord, I pray that you would, you would reveal and put your finger on anything that needs to be addressed. But knowing that the beauty of that is in your revelation of truth is fullness of grace. Wave after wave, grace upon grace, we have received from you. So Lord, we thank you for that good work that you're doing in us. Please help us not um, avoid it, push away, resist, but to surrender and to say, God, this is going to hurt <laughs> But I need that done in my heart. I need your surgery. Lord, whatever it is that you desire to do in these next nine weeks, starting today, would you have your way 
among us. Whatever broader issues, God, make us aware, make us awake. And Lord, I pray specifically for just the individual souls in this room watching online who all have their own struggles. They're all facing different things. Lord, I pray that they could understand this morning and be aware, not just that we have an enemy, but that compared to you, our enemy is puny. He is nothing. You have conquered him. We have a God who is greater than the one who is in this world. God, establish our feet in the truth of the gospel. And may we live out of the power that you have provided for us in the name of Jesus by your Holy Spirit. We pray it in your name, Lord, and thank you.